Next up, we're going to hear from a trio of venture capitalists. They're going to share how they guide their companies and how they look at risk and the impact of the market on what they do. Please welcome Jeff Jordan, Alfred Lin, and Jana Messerschmidt with Fortune's Polina Marinova. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We've got three operators turned investors here. And before we get into your time as investors, what is one very specific thing that you learned as an operator that you still carry with you today about growing companies? Should I start? Um, the biggest one is companies don't grow themselves. And, you, know, you take on these uh, businesses that have momentum and you're, you manage them. Your job is to figure out what's the next act and the next act and the next act. I did a blog where I call it layers on the cake. Mm -hmm. But if you're just sitting there managing the business and not growing it, the future will not be bright. Are there certain types of founders who are better at managing them? Yeah, no, I mean, Brian Chesky just put together um, the experience business on top of the trips business, and it's completely additive. I mean, that business is getting attractive enough to go public on its own. And, you know, he was the product manager on it. One thing I've, I've learned is that at the very beginning, you want to create a culture of excellence. And I think if you want to create a great company, an enduring company, the culture has to be strong. It has to be a performance culture. And it also, you want it to be enduring. Um, and it's easy to, to give lip service to excellence, but the one thing that I've learned in entrepreneurship is you don't get paid by following the 80-20 rule in business. Like 80% of companies fail in the first year and another 80 fail by year five. That means you only have 4% that last five years. And most of the companies that we've been involved with at Sequoia, it's a decade year journey. So unless you want a company that, seed, that starts with excellence at the seed, you're not gonna go all the way to building a long-term company. Yeah, um, I've spent most of my career as an operator. I've uh, recently joined um, Lightspeed as a venture capitalist. And um, you know, kind of looking throughout my career, I was at Netflix for a period of time. And I think Netflix just did an incredible job of staying laser focused on what the company mission was. And I think for a lot of companies, as you grow and scale, it's really easy to get distracted because you're raising tons of capital. There's just like infinite opportunities to go and chase. And it, so it can be pretty hard to be rigorous around staying focused on what that core company mission is. And can you talk a little bit about the different paths that you saw at Netflix versus Twitter and that laser focus? Yeah, you know, so Netflix, when they first started almost two decades ago, the number one goal was that they wanted to be the number one company at delivering movies and TV shows. And I think that has stayed consistent for 20 years. And there's been a lot of changes in the business. Obviously, it went from DVDs in the mail to streaming. It went from licensing other people's content to producing their own. Um, you know, and then compare that kind of with Twitter. So I was at Twitter for about six years for crazy, crazy hyper growth within the company. And we got pretty distracted for a few years. And we, and I think a lot of you guys in this room probably have followed the Twitter story, but we probably should have been laser focused on building that core Twitter consumer experience because user growth was starting to stall a bit and users were still churning significantly. We should have thrown every resource at the company trying to figure that problem out. And we were launching other consumer apps and experiences <laughs> and different businesses. And there was a period of just a few years where I think we could have been more focused. So Jeff, uh, both you and Alfred are early investors in Airbnb. And actually, before I ask you my question, can I get a show of hands how many people when you first heard about Airbnb thought there's no way in hell you were gonna stay at a stranger's house? <laughs> okay, how many of you use Airbnb today? Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Um, can you guys tell me your very first reaction to Airbnb and kind of how your operating experience informed that? So I, I did have that first reaction when I heard about the business, like, you know, oh my God, it's my worst nightmare, staying in someone's house, a stranger staying in my house. And then uh, I heard Brian present Airbnb at a banker's conference, I think it's like nine years ago now. And for me, he was talking about eBay's 
did a new new gen of eBay. Because Jeff was previously at eBay. I, I, how, how long were you there? I was at eBay for seven years. Seven years. Uh, so I think Meg might be in the audience, so that, that would be good somewhere. Um, but it it was a quaint idea that the community took and made better. There were huge trust and safety implications. It's um, it's. Uh, economic empowerment on a massive scale. And so I'm sitting in the audience, I went from complete cynic to complete believer in 30 minutes. But, but what was it that he said that convinced you? I mean, it was just the, the, an, the analogies came real, came alive for me. It's just like, oh my God, he's describing eBay. So I went to the banker, I said, I, I, I'd love to meet him. He goes, that's funny, because he came to the conference and said there was one guy he wanted to meet, and it was you. And when I met him, I said, why? And he goes, eBay's stupid. And it's like, oh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so Sequoia invested in um, Airbnb and the seed, and um, during that time, we also had the reaction that it was a crazy idea, but Greg McAdoo had spent a lot of time in the vacation rental space understanding the landscape, and his view was that we need a special founder uh, that could come along and do something that others have not done in the vacation rental space. And if you think about what great companies have done in the past is to take someone's feature and call it a bug and transform the whole like, thought process around that. And I don't know about you, but my father loved going to the same hotel when he was traveling because he knew exactly where everything was down to where the hairdryer was in the desk. And Brian had a completely different view of what travel should be and he pitched that story, and that story just compelled all of us to sort of believe. The first time I met Brian Chesky, he had come to Zappos to mm -hmm. learn about Zappos and about the culture, and I was blown away by his ability to tell stories. And stories usually have an arc, as your, as your reporter, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and many people in the entrepreneur space just talk about the vision, but here's a, Brian was always a good storyteller telling the vision, but also, laying the groundwork of where the realities of today and how hard this was going to be to create a platform around trust mm -hmm. and then plot the course along the way of adding incrementally creating trust, then calendar, then payments to sort of create a moat around that business. Interesting. And Jana, you were an angel investor in a small electric scooter company we now know as Bird. Um, and when you invested, it was valued in the tens of millions of dollars. Today, it's at 2.3 billion. Can you tell me what you saw in that company when you decided to invest? Yeah, I'd say primarily three things. Um, it was founder market fit, product market fit, and unique distribution advantage. Which Can you kind of explain those concepts? Again? Yeah, um, so the founder of Bird is um, Travis Vanderzanden, who a lot of you in the room probably know. Repeat founder, he had sold his last company, Cherry, which was kind of like Uber for car washes. Um, he had sold that to Lyft. Then he had done time at Uber as an exec. So he knew the mobility space, and he had the great consumer insight, which was basically for trips under two to three miles, they're not well served by ride sharing. Um, they're expensive. The drivers actually don't make as much money as they should. And oftentimes, you're sitting in traffic. And they're also not well served by public transit. So what's another form of mobility that could really serve that market? And so he spent time in China and like tried a bunch of different form factors and he landed on scooters. And he's like, I think this is gonna be a really fun viral experience, which has totally proven out, whether it's Bird or Lime. You guys can probably just go right outside this hotel and see a bunch of Lime scooters as well. Um, but you see these in the physical world and you see people having fun on them. So there's a physical presence, and then there's also a digital presence, because people, when it first launched, they were taking videos, they were posting to social media. So these companies have spent practically zero on marketing to acquire their customers. So those three things made me like run, not but walk. <laughs> back when you invested, did, did they already have a product that you could see and touch and use? He had um, launched like t a, maybe 50 scooters in Santa okay. Monica. Um, just starting to try it out and like hadn't worked out charging, hadn't worked out so many different things. Um, but you know, I think that both Bird and Lime have proven to be very effective at scaling across lots of different markets. He's also a very good storyteller, going back to what you said. That's By the way, before I forget, any idea when Airbnb will go public? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah? Can you share it with us today? I think you should ask Brian Chesky. <laughs> He's not here, though. Um, okay, so investing is about getting it right, but it's also about learning from your mistakes. Jeff, we've talked about a company called Fab.com where you doubled down on that, and it, you know, it had growth up and to the right. It was valued at almost a billion dollars, 
And then it went south so fast that you were kind of like fearing for your job. <laughs> Can you tell Mildly, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a can you tell me about that experience and like what happened there? Well, I mean, the, the fascinating thing, the big, the hardest adjustment for me, I mean, I don't, you may be the same for being an operator to, to being an investor, is it, for the most successful funds, half of the companies don't work. And so that getting comfortable with failure, and if you're not willing to take the risk that can result in failure, you're, you're possibly missing upside. So you, you, you try not to over-rotate on it, but that was, that was a painful investment. I mean, it was one of the fastest growing e-commerce companies ever until it wasn't. But and it's, then, it's ironic because what you saw in that company, you also saw in Airbnb and the two just kind of. Yeah, actually, the, the one that's almost exactly the same is Zulily. Oh, so they were they were doing the same business model of flash sales. You know, uh, uh, it took a little time to, to ship, but when it came, it was a great price and a great design, and you know, people felt like they got a value. So Lily stayed the course and became, has become a very valuable company. I mean, when it traded to QVC, it was over two billion dollars, and Fab didn't stay the course and had a different outcome. And how did you deal with that? Just emotionally, because you had just become an investor. Yeah, it, it was not fun. I mean, one of the hardest parts about being an investor is managing your cycle psychology because you have to be willing to take the next risk. I mean, so when you, you know, we're, we're in Lime scooters, you know, we did a pre-product. Pre, um, and so you want to be leaning forward on the risk taking. And after you've just gotten your clock hand, you know, handed to you, that it takes a little work. So you talk to your partners and you- uh, hey, Can you, you quickly you tell the story of what happened when that investment went south? It was clear it was gonna, you weren't getting your money back when you walked into Mark Andreessen's office. Yeah, well, a couple of the other investors in the company uh, left the company, left their investment companies around oh, yeah. that time. Yeah. So it was uh, two or three of them left suddenly. And so I kind of, I'm new as an investor, so I go into Mark and I wasn't that nervous, but it's just like, hey, anything I should know? And he goes, about what? About you know the fab thing. He goes, oh, are we still in Airbnb? Yeah. Are we still in Pinterest? Yeah. You can stay. And so, <laughs> so this is why he's here today. Um, Alfred, so you have kind of an interesting uh, situation with Uber where you were a personal investor in the seed and series A round, but you couldn't get Sequoia to invest. Well, it wasn't that we couldn't get Sequoia to invest. We failed to dream as a partnership with the entrepreneur. What does fail to dream mean? I think if you look at the company <laughs> at its current state, it would be hard to make the investment. At the time, if you just looked at it as completely a black car service, for the rich and the elite, and if you don't dream that you can either expand the market just to the black car service or beyond that, which is what they've taken over transportation and gone beyond that. And um, just like you know, Jeff has these experiences of losing money, it's painful to lose money. And you can, you'll do all of the sort of post-mortem analysis, et cetera, but at, to keep sanity, I think we at Sequoia also look at all the sins of omission, not those sins of commission. In venture, you can lose one X of the money you invest in, but the gains that you can get from something like an Uber um, is, is not infinite, but it's dramatic. And I think the gain from the Series A was some, it was probably in the $6 billion range, five to $6 billion range. And so lose, you can lose 10 million or 100 million. That doesn't hurt as much as missing out as a partnership, deciding not to make an investment in a fabulous company. But, but can you explain for some of us who aren't familiar with how this works, as an investor at Sequoia, how, what did you see that made you personally invest, but you and your partners didn't see as a firm to invest? Well, when I invested, it was a seed company. It was easy to back a friend who I had gotten to know, and Garrett and Travis and I ended up with Chris Saka, at the first Obama uh, inauguration. And that's was, how you met, right, at, at the Obama inauguration? We, we met before, but we got to know each other at the inauguration because we spent a lot of time together and it was freaking cold. Um, and <laughs> I, I remember like, we're either walking from one part of the event to another part of the event. It was hard to get a taxi. And just like Travis and Garrett just thought, it would be great to have a black car to take us around. And they were envisioning it more as a party service. I see. And so, yes, I could. believed in person. Making, <laughs> making a personal he's, he's investment. He's a party animal, yeah. it turns out. Making, yeah, yeah. making a personal investment among people you've right. gotten to know and you believe in um, is very different than writing a 10, 20, $100 million check uh, 
um, in a company now, you have to justify whether this is right. going to go change the world. Um, and I would also just like go back. Neither Travis nor Garrett wanted to run the company uh, at the time at the seed. So, you know, that was a little strange. It was hard to make the case. Um, I think also, in all fairness, um, if anybody has seen the original Uber seed pitch deck, the market size that they originally dreamed of was only like three or four billion dollars, wow, um, which obviously looks dramatically different now um, to where they've ended up. So I think even though they were dreaming, they weren't even dreaming nearly as big as what it's become. Yeah, yeah. that is for sure true. Um, and Jana, you're involved with Hashtag Angels, which invests, makes uh, angel investments in early stage companies, yep. but you joined Lightspeed December of 2018? Yep. Okay, so you're relatively new. Yes. Um, how is it going from an angel investor to kind of the more professional side? Yeah, I would say um, it's similar to what Alfred said, which is uh, it's one thing to write small personal checks typically to either people you know or who might be one step removed into companies that sound interesting because you can write as many of those checks as the risk you're willing to take on in a given year. Um, professional investing, you only get maybe one or two shots a year. You're writing much bigger checks. Um, you're really signing up for maybe a 10 or 15 year marriage with the company. So it's a very different decision making criteria than what I was used to as an angel investor. Yeah. So Alfred, you just said that you failed to dream big with the entrepreneur. Jeff, I, I read previously you've said um, the best storytellers that in your portfolio are also the best entrepreneurs in building the best companies. But we've obviously seen cases where entrepreneurs can mislead reporters, investors, everybody. Um, so how do you differentiate between, especially in the early days, between vision and delusion? Um, the, the answer I would give is it's a very fine line. It's a fine um, line. I mean, and so the venture process is a little of an unusual process. Ideally, you've met with the founder multiple times over the years and gotten to know them. But, but today it moves. I just wrote about a right. company in a week. Yeah, no, and, and, but there are the situations where you have to make a decision. You know, they, they, I have four term sheets. You know, I, I can't wait past Monday night and it's Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and you're just kind of then you're doing that. So you're trying to get the read on... Are, they, they need to be charismatic and they need to be able to sell their vision of the future to investors, employees, reporters, partners, things like that. But they can't, you, you don't want them to go over that line where they, I mean, I, I have one invest, one in, uh, company that I work with where I, you know, Steve Jobs had his um, a reality distortion field. Unfortunately, the CEO was in his own reality distortion <laughs> field. And, you know, that was, you know, that was frustrating. So that line is really tight. And you, you know, the, the what value. What do you look at? I mean, it, it, where, did you, <laughs> where did you think they are in that line? You want them up towards it, but not over But it's like more of a. A yeah, yeah it, 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 it's a gut yeah. intuition. Alfred? Well, Mike Moritz once told me, because I was too much into the facts of the company, that don't ever let the facts get away, get in the way of a good story. Um, and he was also, he's a pretty good investor, he's also a pretty good journalist, and I retorted back that I think the best stories are based in facts. Or based in facts. Based in facts. And again, back to the sort of, are you, are you dreaming? Are you delusional? It has to do with whether you can see a future that doesn't exist today, but are you able to sort of be centered in the realities of today and show that you can plot the course to that future? If you don't have like the right sort of trajectory on that, you're, you're not going to lead your company to the promised land. And so as much vision as you might have, if you're not focus on the facts of today and how you overcome the issues that you have, it will just be a very, very long journey in, in a walk in the woods. So you look for some like early indicators that... Yeah, I, if, when I spent time with Tony at DoorDash, um, we didn't get there at the seed, but at the A, and um, he, during that time, and so part of the reason we didn't invest in the seed partly was the round dynamics, it was moving really, really fast, and we wanted to get a little bit more fact-based. And between then and the A, we learned how the cohorts were performing. We learned how he was actually breaking down the business into what seemed like pick up from a restaurant, drop it off, go to a next restaurant, et cetera, into five process, um, 
five processes, then 10, then 15, then 20. Very methodical. Uh, and I think the best operators think about their business in very methodical ways. And Jana, you invest really early. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely um, an adjustment, you know, coming from angel world where you don't have really any data um, on how the company is doing. Um, you just kind of have your intuition and the team and the market size and how you think it's going to go. Um, and now looking at you know Series A and Series B opportunities where there is some data, but there still really usually isn't enough to ever like give you like a clear sense. You still have to take a big leap of faith with mm -hmm. the founder um, that it still has the upside and the potential um, because there's still just such limited data. They might have a year or two worth of data um, where they've been iterating a bunch trying to figure out product market fit. Yeah, um, I'll come to you guys for questions uh, after this one, so uh, please keep them in mind. Uh, really quickly, so what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of times, I mean, there's a lot of capital, deals move quickly, it's hard to get to know people, <laughs> so you need time. But because there's so much capital, I mean, uh, Sequoia raised an $8 billion global fund last year, um, Andreessen's raising, raising late stage, Lightspeed. Um, what, what do you guys, do you guys think that capital itself can be a prime differentiator for a company these days? For a investment firm or for a for operating a, company? Investment it, firm. Yeah. Um, uh, I think capital is necessary but not sufficient. You, uh, you're talking about an investment firm? An investment firm. Okay, I'm talking about the company itself. Oh, the company. So the, the question is, is this company, so if, does cash differentiate? Yes, so if I have a competitor, if I get $100 okay. million dollars right now? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, it depends on the market dynamics, but you know, sometimes capital is just table stakes and everyone's going to get it. And there are other times where you, the strategy is trying to narrow uh, the people who will get capital. And so um, you know, some of the aggressive uh, uh, progress announcements you see is, or you know, funding announcements you see is, is frankly trying to chill capital to uh, other competitors in the uh, in the in the milieu, so it, it is one of the factors. The best factor of performance, though, is can the company perform, not just can they get capital. But doesn't, isn't it kind of like, if I have more capital, I can perform better and grow faster? Yes, theoretically, but having more capital means you, the, the, the assumption is you deploy it effectively, and what happens, you know, we, we've seen many cases where companies got capital and got sloppy in their performance and execution and went through the capital at a much faster pace Mm -hmm. than they probably would have if they didn't have the capital. So some level of hunger leads to a better company if you if you're just have enormous resources that is going to be challenging. So at Sequoia, we, we invest from idea to IPO and beyond. Um, and I think the capital differentiation is not as important in the very, very early stages. And it, you're trying to figure out an idea. It's not that doesn't take that much capital to figure out whether your idea has merit or not. Um, at the seed level. As you move up, depending on the industry, as um, Jeff mentioned, it, capital can become a strategic weapon. Um, I believe and that- how so? You can grow faster, you can get into more cities, you can expand more quickly. There are things where you have global network effects, like Airbnb, where I don't think capital is as strategic of a weapon. And then there are companies that have local network effects, whether it's on demand, like DoorDash, or Instacart, <laughs> that we're both investors in or, um, or ride sharing. Um, those, those kind of uh, industries, capital can be a strategic weapon. But capital is not always all that useful. In fact, I think capital allows you to be sloppy. And companies that raise cap lots of capital, whether they need it as a strategic weapon or not, uh, and they raise too much, can become, they are just not as good operators because they have that cushion. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Airbnb's side, you know, the reason we have this $8 billion fund is not to chase more, act more companies, it's to invest in our existing companies globally. Is it, is it true that you did it to compete with SoftBank or no, to at least part no, of? No, frankly, like how do you compete with $8 billion or $100 billion if you're gonna play the same game? So the, the game we're playing is we find companies at the seed level, like Airbnb, we own 20% at the time, we tried during that time to invest as much as we could into Airbnb, and today we have I don't know, 11, 12 percent ownership. We got diluted along the way, and they have three, over three billion dollars in the bank. 
So clearly, they do not need to raise $3 billion. Right. And so it's not dilution to us, as I told Brian and Joe and Nate. It's like dilution to you, too. So as founders, if you could, you would raise money just in time. Of course, if you did that, you wouldn't be able to sleep on each and every night. So you obviously have to raise more than that. But I think we have, since capital has become cheap, uh, the sort of delusion is that capital will save you. It won't save you. Yeah. And Jana, very quickly, so you can. Yeah. Um, so I would say, like, the great example of capital being used as a war chest is Uber. You know, they raised more than $15 billion, um, before going uh, public here recently. And that was a huge strategic asset for them to compete against Lyft, um, as well as other regional players, depending on which markets that they were in. And it also allowed them to go into really uh, strategic businesses like food delivery, autonomous vehicles um, that you know, some of these other ride-sharing players aren't playing in. Great. Question? No? <laughs> Is Adam around? There we go. <laughs> Do we want Adam to get the mic? No, 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 no. Please give it to someone else, please. <laughs> Only doing this because no one else raised their hand. So uh, when I think about differentiators, I don't think of VCs as being the nicest people I've met in my career. And I think of the three of you as among the nicest people I've known in my career. I'm glad you went that route, yeah. And <laughs> I wonder if you think that's been, that, that helps you as an investor, or if you have to overcome your lack of jerkiness? That's a good question. <laughs> I'll let you go first. <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the entrepreneur. <laughs> I, I think, like, we all, we all differentiate ourselves. Look, capital is cheap, as we said. We differentiate ourselves by operating a different way than some other investors. And it used to be that entrepreneurs would come to Silicon Valley, go on Sand Hill, go from firm to firm, and they were allowed to just be in their ivory towers. That no longer is the case. Some people differentiate by having operating experience like we do. Some people differentiate by being originally angel investors and getting a large network. Some people differentiate by blogging. I think the, one, the most interesting thing to me about this industry is that there are very successful venture capitalists of all kinds of backgrounds. And that is quite fascinating. There are jerks and there are nice people. There are um, salespeople, there are finance people, there are operators, there are former VPs of engineering. And you can be successful in this business because you decide that you're going to create an edge around what you have and your skills. And mine happens to be operating hard companies. Um, and that's my edge. I like those kind of companies. Yeah. I mean, to, to the question I thought you were asking before, you, you need a source of differentiation as yeah. capital. There is just too much capital. And so you, you, what is going to attract an entrepreneur to you? Um, I personally like to work with people who I think are nice people and, and share a common set of values. So there's almost a positive selection bias in that, inherent in that, that, you know, I, 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 I thank you for saying we're nice, but I, I, I'd like the, uh, the nice people to be attracted to that so that I can work with them. Yeah, I would say, um, kind of going back to like how crazy these funding cycles are, that's probably one of the things I've been the most surprised at, is just how quickly things happen. And how, you know, in the matter of maybe a week, you're supposed to get to know an entrepreneur, get to know a market, and make a decision of whether you're going to be married for the next 10 years. Um, you know, I was the gal who dated my husband for three years before getting married. I wasn't the gal who eloped in Vegas on a whim. <laughs> so it's very counter um, to that. But I think, like, being able to spend real time with entrepreneurs and sussing each other out, understanding if you have, you know, common non-jerkiness, um, to quote Adam, but also just common goals of how you want to work together. Um, I think that that's, I hope our industry returns to a more sane cycle. And as much competition as there is, there's a lot of co-opetition as well. Like, we worked together on Airbnb. Jenna was a former uh, Sequoia scout and helped us find Vector. Vector is also an investor. It, Lightspeed's also an yeah. inve investor in Lightspeed. So there is friendly competition here, and there always will be. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.